Hello and good morning, Sandra. How are you doing today? Hello, Errol. You know the 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 magazine cover. I grew up with National Geographic, so it's always going to be a magazine to me. The Hello? the book cover uh, says National Geographic Kids. You're now on the line with Arrow. Hello and good morning, Sandra. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Arrow. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. I'm always going to look at it as being the National Geographic's magazine because that's the generation I come from. But boy, this book, and I know on the outside cover it says National Geographic Kids, but I'm telling you, this is an adult book as well. It totally is an adult book as well. I think it's great for everyone to dive into water with this book. Water is a huge part of my poetry, the way that I write, the way that I walk in life. And because I'm always inspired by that raindrop that's going to find its way to the ocean. And you give me an opportunity to dive deeper into the spiritual shape of water. Well, I'm glad for that. And again, I'm, you know, I wrote the foreword for this book, but the author uh, is, is Lisa Gary. Yeah. But all credit to her, too, and, and the whole team at Nat Geo for, for pulling this book together. It's, it's a fabulous book, and it really does. You're absolutely right. It goes into, you know, sort of all of the elements of water, the spiritual aspects, the magical aspects, the, the very practical aspects, how much we need water for. Um, it's all there, and I think it's, it's so multidimensional in exactly these ways, and it allows everyone to connect to water in whatever way makes the most sense to them and become interested, more interested in, in conserving it and protecting it. Well, the entire gang at National Geographics, they, they totally understand and they're, and they're so willing to teach it that everything on this planet needs water. And I hope this opens up a lot of people's eyes. Well, I hope so too. And it, it really is the most fundamental thing that we can say about water, that it is the basis of life. And it, we say it, water is life, water is life, but really coming to grips with that is, is so key because, you know, because of water scarcity and, and droughts and depletion of water and then climate change you know, and, and habitat loss, we're, we're losing life. And I think water and protecting it and conserving it and making sure that we share water with the natural world, which we are part of, of course, is really critical and understanding that water's finite. Yes. There's only so much there and that using it wisely, sharing it with each other and with nature is essential to all of us having a secure future and a happy future. So I think I think that connection is, is really critical. You hit it right on the head. Well, you hit it on the head when you said share, because I, I don't want to bring any politics in here, but over the past couple of days, they're trying to reshape the flow of the water of, of the Colorado River, but a lot of states are going to suffer. And, and right away, my heart it, it has been crying because it's like, no, we, we can't take away the water from these areas that were already thirsty. And so, I mean, I, we, we have to figure out how to share it better. We do have to figure out how to share it better. And there's... An ethical question to that. There's a technological question to that. There's an equity question to that. And and I think applying all of those values is really critical. Um, the fact of the matter is we're using more water in the Colorado River Basin, to cite the example you brought up. We're using more water than is there, which means we're depleting it. Yes. And we have not been sharing with nature. If you go to the very end of the Colorado River, the delta, the Delta has not received water for decades, mm. right? There's no water flowing through the Delta anymore. And that used to be a beautiful, beautiful wetland for birds and wildlife. And it's, it's a desiccated place now. But what we've learned from an experiment that's been going on for the last, oh, 10, 15 years now, is that if we give some water back, life returns. I was down there um, to see part of this experiment, and it was just amazing to see that when you allow water to flow back through that delta, the life begins to return. And that's a hopeful message that even if we have sort of lost wetlands here and there, we've depleted rivers here and there, we've dammed rivers all over the place, if we can let them flow again, if we can bring water back to them, if we can restore wetlands, life comes back. Nature is resilient if we give it a chance. And I think that is 
a very important message, a very hopeful message as we go forward. You're so right about that because that's happening here in the Carolinas. They just they just redid uh, this whole entire lay of land and brought water to a river that's been dry for 100 years. And and I cannot wait to watch how nature is going to change in this Great Falls, South Carolina area because it's it's going to change the concept of thought as well as the human concept of where we're growing because we you know we just accept things when they happen. Oh, it's nature. Oh, it's nature. Well, as humans, let's do something about it. That's right. We're part of nature, and we have a huge influence now on nature. I mean, what we've heard is from, from biologists is that the sixth extinction is underway, and it's being driven by us, which means we have an obligation and a responsibility and the ability to do something about that. And I think it's very important, and water is just a critical piece of that. You know, one of the most hopeful things I've seen in this country um, is that over the last 30 years, we have moved toward taking down dams that we no longer need. These were dams that might have been built in the 19th century for textile mills and so on, and they're no longer functioning as as dams in the way they were built, but they're still blocking the rivers, and often they're a safety issue. You know, if they're not being maintained, they they can break down. And so we're taking them down intentionally. We've taken down about 1,600 dams, mostly small ones, but some sizable ones, which is letting rivers flow free again and restoring habitat, which is giving fish and aquatic life the habitat they need to come back. And the really inspiring part of that story is that within a year or two, populations of fish come back in big numbers. I mean, I think more in a larger numbers than most of us would have expected whether it's shad or salmon, they come back when given the opportunity. And again, that's the resilience of nature if we, if we give it a chance. The book we're talking about is National Geographic's Kids, and the title is Water. Let's, let's go the route of the kids right now, because I, the kid in me came out when I heard that water that came from dinosaurs or during the dinosaur age we're, we're still drinking today. How is that possible? <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, well, it's because water is finite, right? There might be a little bit of water that's added through what we call cosmic snowballs, you know, that bring a little bit of water in. But for the most part, the water that's here on Earth now has been here since the beginning of the creation of Earth, right? And so that water is finite, and it cycles across space and across time. And so the water that I made, you know, used to make my coffee this morning, yes, it could have quench the thirst of a dinosaur hundreds of millions of years ago. It's wild to think about. It's also fun to think about because, you know, it connects everything. It connects me to the dinosaurs and it connects everything that's here now. So it's a very, uh, it's a fun fact really that, um, that, that that water doesn't go away. It changes form. It might be, you know, water vapor in the atmosphere at one point, then it'll come down as rain or snow, then it'll become part of the groundwater or part of a lake, and then it'll evaporate back to the atmosphere and condense and fall as rain all over again on different time scales. So these molecules are, are constantly supporting life in different places in different ways, and we're a part of that now. And I think that connection is, I think, a really kind of fun an important way to think about water. And we should put focus on life in the water because the beauty of a river, especially the river in yeah. Colombia, with what it does every single year, what a landscape of beauty. Absolutely. I mean, rivers are, are, are really remarkable when you, when you think about them. And, and they cross, and of course, one of the challenges for how we manage them and share them is that they're constantly crossing boundaries from mm-hmm. state to state, from country to country. So again, back to our point of sharing, it's so important to share that water with each other and with nature. Mm-hmm. And I just, I'm always still amazed that, you know, when you go to someplace like the Columbia Gorge or the Grand Canyon, that water basically created these amazing features, you know, that, that water um, could carve the Grand Canyon over time is, is still a sort of a mind-boggling thing, just the magic of water that we see in so many different ways. 
oh, I so invite so many people to read this book. And, you know, it's, I think one of the most fascinating things that happened, there's, there's a performer on NBC's The Voice this year that's from St. Louis, and we got hooked up on talking about the Missouri River. Nobody talks about the Missouri River, but, man, it was fascinating because it's the water. I love the water, and we talked about this in the very beginning. There's something about water that creates the stories to be told. That's right. I mean, you think about the, you know, the Mark Twain stories of the Mississippi and, you know, the Missouri joins the Mississippi right there at St. Louis and then flows on down to New Orleans. And and the Mississippi, you know, as part of that, excuse me, the Missouri as part of that Mississippi basin together, that's about 40 percent of the continental United States that's draining into the Missouri and Mississippi and then heading down to the Gulf of Mexico. So a big portion of our country is in that watershed and managing that river. You know, it's, it's of course, been dammed for flood control and hydropower and irrigation, as most rivers have been. But there's still an opportunity to, you know, to to bring back more health and, and more life in those in those rivers. Wow. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Well, thank you. I'd, I'd love to. Well, you be brilliant today, OK? Well, you do the same. Thank you very much for taking the time. You bet. Thank you.